this morning. I want to wish you a happy Memorial Day and make sure that we remember um, those who sacrificed so much for us. I was thinking about this week that uh, Arlington Cemetery um, was one of my favorite places to go when we visit D.C. to watch the changing of the guard. And I was privileged to do a funeral there one time. And it's just a special place. Um, and I was thinking about it because when we go to Arlington Cemetery, we look at, we watch the changing of the guard. And this morning, we're talking about the changing of the guard. We're talking about when, when Moses is coming to the end of his life and Joshua is going to begin. And, um, and I think it's important that we remember those that sacrificed everything to give us the freedoms that we have. Um, I think it's important that tomorrow when you celebrate Memorial Day, yes, we're going to eat hot dogs and hamburgers and all that stuff, but remember what it's about. And, um, and just uh, be thankful for those who sacrifice so much. Today we're continuing our study in the book of Numbers, and this morning is uh, a very interesting passage of Scripture. Moses is literally, God's going to tell him, Moses, you're going to go on this mountain, and then you're going to come down, and Moses, you're going to die. Um, I hope God doesn't do that with me. I hope he just surprises me one day. I hope the, my, my prayer is that the rapture comes, and I go out like Elijah, you know, we'll just go up and go up like that, but if not, I don't want to know about it, so I don't want to have a... Uh, an idea of when it's coming. But this morning was a, in, uh, this morning's been interesting. Nita is in Virginia visiting her mom, and I am an early morning person, so I wake up at four o'clock every morning. It's just I, if I stay up till midnight, I'm gonna wake up at four o'clock in the morning. It's just my schedule. So my schedule's been all off this morning because usually I get up, I can have my quiet time, and she gets up and and but I I just she wasn't there, so I got through with all my stuff and. It's about 6 o'clock, and I'm like, all right, I got like a couple more hours till church here. So I ended up coming up here early. But um, but this is a, a fascinating passage of Scripture. And what I'd like to do, I, I want you to stand with me, and I want to read verses 12 through, 22, or through 23 of Numbers chapter 27. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain of Abiram range and see the land that I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you will also be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother was when the community uh, quarreled in the wilderness of Zen, both of both of you rebelled against my command to show my holiness in the sight of the waters. Those were the waters of Meribah of Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen. So Moses appealed to the Lord, may the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the community who will go out before them and come back in before them and who will bring them out and bring them in so that the Lord's community won't be like the sheep without a shepherd. The Lord replied to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man who uh, who has the spirit on in him. And lay your hands on him, and have him stand before Eleazar the priest, and the whole community, and commission him in their sight. Confer some of your authority on him, so that the entire Israelite community will obey him. He will stand before Eleazar, who will consult the Lord for him with the decision of the, uh, of the Urim. He and all the Israelites with him, even the entire community, will go out and come back in at his command. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua, had him stand before Eleazar the priest, and the entire community laid his hands on him and and commissioned him as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Father, as we come before you this morning and we look at this passage of Scripture and we see this commissioning of Joshua, Lord, and we see the end of Moses' life, Lord, and, and God, uh, even as we think of Memorial Day, Lord, and, and think of, uh, of the leadership uh, of people that have gone on before us, Lord, I pray, God, that this morning that you'll speak to our hearts and, Lord, that, you'll just, that we'll be able to see, Lord, the qualities that you can use in each one of us. God, I pray that this morning, Lord, that you'll be glorified, God, and that you'll be blessed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
So it starts with Moses. Uh, the Lord told Moses, go up into the mountain of Abiram. Now, it's interesting because we find this passage, or this, this story told in a lot of different places in the Bible. And sometimes you read it's the mountain of Abiram, and sometimes it's, uh, it's um, uh, Mount Nebo or Pisgah. And you're like, all right, which mountain, which mountain did he go up? And it's a mountain range, and it's a specific mountain that he's going on. And so when you read it in different places of your Bible, don't be confused. It's the same mountain. It's just it's the same mountain range. It's just he's told to go up to a specific thing. So if they say it's Mount Nebo, you can't say, well, see, the Bible's wrong. It's not wrong. It's just giving you more specific information here. Um. But God tells Moses, go up to this mountain, and God's going to show Moses the promised land. Remember, we talked about it before at length, that Moses can't go into the promised land. Why can't Moses go into the promised land? He struck the rock, right? He sinned. He he rebelled against God. He misrepresented God. We talked about it last week, that he misrepresented God and showed God as this angry God when he struck the rock. And God told him that you misrepresented me, Moses. And so he wasn't allowed to go in there. But he tells him, Moses, I want you to go up here and I'm going to show you the promised land. And I, I believe this is like a supernatural sighting of the promised land because it's very interesting because if you look at it from a, a geographic standpoint, when he goes up on this mountain, all he would have to do is look north and west and he would be able to see all of the land that Israel would ever occupy. But he wasn't just showing him the land. In fact, he tells him, look to the north and look to the south and look to the east and look to the west. And this is the land that I'm giving you. And it's interesting because Israel's never inhabited all that land yet. But God made this promise way back to Abraham. And he and they will they will uh, inhabit all this land one day. But. God tells Moses, go on this mountain, and God's going to show Moses the promised land. And then Moses, it says, is going to be gathered to his people just like Aaron. In other words, Moses, you're going to go up on this mountain, and then, buddy, you're going to die. It seems harsh when we think about it, because we look at all that Moses did. I mean, Moses never was able to live with his people because he, because when he was a baby, he was put, his parents put him in a basket because he should have been killed. And he goes down, and Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and he grows up in the palace and everything. Then he kills a, then he realizes he's a Hebrew, and he he kills the he kills the guard, and ends up running into the wilderness, and marries another woman, and lives there, and like living out his life there. And then God appears to him in a burning bush and says, "Moses, go tell him, let my people go." And so Moses has to go and tell Pharaoh, hey, uh, God says, let my people go. And he has to tell him and, and all these people that probably don't even like him because he lived in the palace his whole life. He's got to get them, convince them to follow him. And so he says, God, how am I going to do that? I, 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 I stutter anyway. They're not going to believe anything I say. And he says, tell him I am sent you. Oh, that's going to do it. All right, Lord. But he did. He walked and he went faithfully and followed God. And God made him the leader over the people. And God, we saw all the miracles that he did, that they crossed the Red Sea, that God swallowed up the armies of Egypt after him. And and all of the things that he did, he, he, he followed God. He was faithful to God. And that one glaring point in time where he misrepresented God, and now he doesn't get to go into the promised land. But as we look at this passage, I think there's two things in this part of it that we can see. Is One is that God showed Moses grace. But not only did he show him grace, he showed him the fear of the Lord. And both are critical to us as Christians. First, I want you to see how he showed him grace. God gave Moses this supernatural vision of the land. Why do I say that? He showed it to him here in chapter 27, but both in chapter 32 and 34 as well. He talks about it in Deuteronomy 3.27 as he receives the same vision that Abraham received. In fact, it says there, go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan. When he looks at the land standing on Abiram, he would only have to look northwest to see all of Israel, but God said, look at all of it. 
It's exactly what God showed Abraham in Genesis 13, 14. And it affirms to Moses, the next generational leader. It affirms to him that God is faithful in his promise. God was going to be faithful to his promise. He shows him exactly the same thing that, that Abraham saw. In fact, in Genesis 13, 14, when Abraham, it says, Then the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from this place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. And the Lord said to him, This, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. It's amazing grace that God showed Abraham. God's grace not only allowed Moses to see the land, but to see it at Israel, the land that Israel's yet to possess. He he was showing God, or he was showing Abraham the supernatural vision of of all that God was going to do future wise. He was reaffirming the com- the covenant that he made with Abraham that he was going to give it to all these people. And you know what's amazing? What's really awesome? is when you think about the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses got to go to the Promised Land. And he got to go to the Promised Land the same way everybody else gets to go to the Promised Land with Jesus. So there's amazing grace that we see that God gives to Moses here. And Moses knew that he'd sinned. He knew that he wasn't allowed to go in the Promised Land. And he's okay with that. The second thing I want you to see is it, it, this passage reminds me of the fear of the Lord. You see, God takes sin seriously. God doesn't play with sin. As great a man as Moses was, and no doubt he was a great man, he was the only man that spoke face to face with God. God gave him the Ten Commandments, the law for all of Western civilization. God protected him. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. I mean, this guy's a pretty amazing guy. God protected him and commissioned him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we could go on and on and on. But God could not allow Moses to enter the promised land because Moses sinned and misrepresented God. One thing that I I see as, as I go through these passages of two of maybe two of the greatest leaders that were ever on earth is one. I don't see Moses ever complaining about the fact that he wasn't allowed to go in the promised land. It's interesting because I look at it and I, and I'm like, Lord, that's just not fair. Lord, maybe something, I mean, something could have been done. Moses never once complained about not going in the promised land. He never said, God, this this is my right. After all that I've done for you, Moses had a right perspective on who God is. And he had a right perspective on righteousness. I mean, think about the guy that stood and talked with God. He understood what righteousness was. Remember Moses when he went on the mountain and and there were thunders and lightnings and, and the Shekinah glory cloud was there and all of Israel was petrified and they're terrified and they won't go up there. And Moses walks right up into the right up into the Shekinah glory cloud and he speaks with God face to face. I want to tell you something. Moses understood God's holiness and his righteousness. Remember Moses saw the the, the theophany where God appeared to him in the burning bush and he fell down on his face and he realized this is holy ground and he realizes that this God that I'm serving is a holy and a righteous God. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of the fact of how holy our God is that we serve. And we have this idea that it's like this, we're we're flippant in our Christian walk and we're flippant in our Christian faith because we don't understand the depth of holiness like Moses did. And I think it's important that we recognize that. And there is a fear of the Lord that is missing in our culture today. And there's a fear of the Lord that's missing in our world today. And it's missing because we've lost sight of the fact that God is a righteous judge. He is a holy, righteous God. See, Moses knew God and he understood the consequences of sin. Today, everyone else is to blame. Everyone other than the sinner. We, we transfer the blame on everybody. I, this week was horrible. We had a shooting in another school. And it just, it breaks your heart and you just, 
And I, I, I just turned the TV off this week because I turned it on for about five minutes. And they're blaming the police. And they're blaming this person. They're blaming that person. I'm thinking, what about the guy that pulled the trigger? We, we blame everybody but me. We, I mean, we have a president that stands up there and he blames everybody, but where the blame lays? Let's just give, we'll blame everybody, but where it lays. And, and he's not the only one. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And everyone's transferring the blame. And they're playing the game and they're hiding the shame. We have a sin epidemic in our world. We, we, we blame people, we, we blame the pharmaceutical companies for people doing drugs or the alcohol companies for making alcohol. Listen, the, the blame lies squarely on the person who does it. And until we come to that, because until we come to that and we recognize that, how can we have repentance and forgiveness of sin? How can we see repentance is that I'm walking this way and I recognize that the way that I'm walking is wrong and I stop and I repent and I turn from it and I walk the other way. And Moses understood that. And why didn't Moses complain about not being able to go to the promised land? Because Moses knew that it was his sin that kept him there. It's really interesting because the next verse, we see Moses appeal to the Lord. And, and as soon as you read it, you think, oh man, Moses is going to appeal to God and say, God, let me in the promised land. No. You, you talk about leadership. Here's a leader. Verses 15 and 17, it says, Moses spake to the Lord saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in. That the congregation of the Lord may not be, be as sheep that have no shepherd. You know what? Moses wasn't worried about his fate. Moses said, hey, God, I'll come down off the mountain. I'll die. Hallelujah. I'll be with you. He wasn't. God, that's. Fair. I did this and I did this and God, you got to give it to me. Now. No, Moses said, hey, God, what about your people? God, they're going to need a leader. I'm concerned about your people. And how many times have we seen Moses in this book of Numbers intercede for the people? How many times was God about to wipe them out and Moses interceded and Aaron interceded? You remember he, took, he sent Aaron with the uh, with the. Uh, I forget what it's called, where he's shaking the stuff, the, the incense. He's burning the incense and he's running and shaking it over all the people. Why? So they wouldn't die. Why? Because Moses was concerned about the people. That's what a leader does. A leader is concerned more about the people than he is with his own health and with his own welfare. Talk about leadership traits. This verse starts with Moses spoke to the Lord saying, the Holman Christian Standard says it better, I think. It says, it says Moses appealed to the Lord saying. He's making an appeal to the Lord. His appeal is for the people. And so many in leadership today, or so few in leadership today, want what's best for the people. It's all about getting reelected. It's all about getting what, what's mine. It's all about keeping my power. It's all about everything but the people. I, I think about it on Memorial Day, because we are supposed to be a government of the people and by the people and for the people. Moses' appeal was for the people. It seems like so many or so few are interested in what the people want at all. But Moses appealed to the Lord even in his final appeal, appeal was for the people. Now, I don't know if Moses had anybody in mind, mate. You know, I was thinking about this. Here's Moses, and he's about to, he's saying, God, we need, they need a leader. They need somebody that can take them in or out. And I mean, just a few chapters ago, we read about this guy, Phineas. I mean, Phineas shish kebab, the couple that was in, in, in sin. And I mean, man, he's the man of the hour. Everybody, I mean, you talk about a, a popular pick, somebody that can win the election. You know, here's the guy that can win the election. I mean, he's popular. He's at the height of his, his career. You know, um, the people would be on board with it. He'd be a popular pick. But God wasn't looking for Phineas. 
And I, I think sometimes in our world today, we're all we're looking for this Phineas. We're looking for the guy who's the man of the hour. Who's the man right now? And who's the man that can, you know, they can stir it up. And, and you know, the, the guy that's the natural born leader. But you know, God wasn't concerned with what the people wanted. God wanted people that would serve him. You know, there are a lot of churches that are building large congregations by giving people what they want. And you can make a lot of friends by appealing to people. But you can't do God's will by appealing to people. God knows what they need. God knows exactly what the people need. You know, we, we live in a world today where it's like there's this formula. You want to build, you want to build a big church, you know, then you ease up on sin. Because, you know, if, you, you know if, you, if you're hard on sin, people don't like it. They don't leave church with all these warm fuzzies. Well, that's not what God said. That's not what God wants. You know, if you want, a, you want to build a big church, you've got, to have, you've got to have a big band with the right, the right music and the right people there. Because if not, you know, the people aren't going to like it and they're, and they're not going to want to come. That's not, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. Listen, I believe that we ought to do the best. We ought to put our best foot forward. We ought to put. We ought to make everything we do the best that we possibly can. But sometimes we're chasing after the wrong things, and we we're looking for this guy Phineas that's going to be, you know, he's going to be the rock star, and he's going to be the guy that everybody's going to look up to, and everybody's going to go, "Ooh, he he's so flowery with his words," and I get tingles every time I hear him speak. Was, was it, I can't remember who the guy was that said when Obama spoke, he got chills down his leg. But God isn't looking for the same thing we look for. And God chose Joshua. Now, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Growing up, I thought Joshua was like, I thought Joshua was like, you know, the cool kid on campus. You know, he was the guy that was going to be the first pick. He was the leader of everybody. I mean, he was the guy that everybody looked up to. He was this natural born leader that everyone was going to rally around and like, you know, he was just he was just ready to go and it was just going to be this smooth transition. But when I study scripture, I don't see that at all. In fact, look at look at what it says here. Verses 18 to 22. It says, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun. He was Catholic. Come on, lighten up. That was funny. Take Joshua, the son of Nun. A man whom is the spirit. And lay your hands on him. And make him stand before Eleazar, the priest. And all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. Why does he want to commission them in their sight? Because he wants them to know. Because no one's looking for Joshua. Let me tell you something. Joshua was like a fly on a wall. Nobody paid any attention to him. How do I know that? Just go back through Scripture. I mean, like I said, I grew up thinking that Joshua was this type A personality. He was always leading, always the popular pick. But Joshua was around for more than 40 years, and he's hardly noticed by the people. In fact, when Joshua and Caleb came back and they, they went into the land, and they were the two spies that came back and said, we have to go into the land right now because God's given us land. Everybody poo-pooed them and said, oh, no, shh, you can't say anything, Joshua. Just sit down and shut up. You're not, you're not that important. Who's left? Joshua and Caleb. Who's going to go in the land that's that old? Joshua and Caleb. But no one listened to him. He stood up and made a speech that, hey, we are called to go into the promised land right now. And the people hushed him. Who are you? You're just Moses' servant. You're nobody, Joshua. Just sit down and shut up. Take your place where you're supposed to be. They were... They, they should have went in the promised land, but they were despised. No one was going to listen to them. But we see Joshua a lot in other passages. In Exodus 24, 13, we see Joshua. Remember, I, I talked about the Shekinah glory cloud that's over the mountain. And Moses is going up to receive the Ten Commandments. You know who went with them? Joshua. 
Everybody else is cowering down at the, at the bottom of the mountain, afraid to move. Joshua goes all the way up to the edge of this shining glory cloud. He wasn't allowed to go in there, but he sat there for six days and he waited for Moses to come out. Joshua was there. In Exodus 33:11, Joshua is in the tabernacle when God spoke to Moses face to face. It says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. God, I don't want to leave your glory. God, I could stay here forever, Lord. God, God, you're amazing and I don't want to leave this. You talk about a guy who had a heart for God. He wasn't, the, he wasn't, I don't believe this guy's the outright leader and he's the guy everybody was looking for. In fact, I think that's why at the end they have to, they have to commission him. They have to make sure that he, that everybody else knows that this is the guy that God chose. Like David, do you remember when they went to get David, King David, and they, and he, and God anointed him king. God wanted Samuel to anoint him king and Samuel's like, um, isn't there anybody else? I mean, there's got to be somebody else. I mean, this little kid, he can't be, he can't be the one. Listen, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Can you imagine being Joshua? That he saw it all. He never stood against Moses. When Korah rebelled, Joshua wasn't consulted. No one was looking, no one was looking at him as a leader. Joshua was, was not uh, assuming the position. I believe that he was probably reluctant. He had seen the trouble that Moses had. And when you see, when you see behind the curtain, sometimes you go, oh, I don't want any part of that. Deuteronomy 1.28, way back at the beginning, the Lord said to Moses, Joshua, the son of Nun, who attends you, will enter it. He's going to be the one to enter the promised land. Encourage him, for he will enable Israel to inherit it. Joshua was an attendant for Moses. Not a big time job. He was his servant. But God told Moses that Joshua was going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. It's interesting to me that Moses, as great a leader as he was, couldn't bring the people into the promised land. Why? He sinned, yes. But everybody else had sinned too. All of sin come short of the glory of God. But I think there's there's so many symbols in this book that just I wish I could spend more time going through them. But do you remember how the children of Israel, how they would line up? And they would line up in the shape of a cross. Every time they moved, they would move in the shape of a cross. As people, if like when uh, when they were up on the mountain looking down at them, they saw the shape of the cross that's marching through the desert. It's fascinating. I, just how, I wonder when they recognized that Jesus died on the cross, they had to be gone. <laughs> but you know what Moses represents all throughout the Scripture? The law. The law. Do you know that the law can never save you. All the law can do is condemn you. And Moses is the representative of the law. And he can't go into the promised land. I don't think that's by accident either. You talk about symbolic. But here comes Joshua. You know what Joshua translates to? Literally, Jesus. He's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And the law could never get you there. Only Jesus can get you to the promised land. The law can never bring you into the promised land. All it could do is condemn you. But here is this humble servant, Joshua, whose name literally translates to Jesus is going to bring them into the promised land. The symbolism of this book's amazing. It's just, it's not by accident. When you read it, and it's over and over and over again. 
we can't be saved by the law. And there's some people, there are a lot of people in this world today who are trying to earn their way to heaven. They think if I can be good enough, if I can be, if I can accomplish this, if I can do this, if I can just, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say my prayers and I'll go to church and I'll, I'll be kind to people and I'll be generous to people. Let me tell you something. All that does is condemn you. The Bible says that my righteousness is as filthy rags. The very best things I can do are as filthy rags. I won't even tell you what that literally translates to. There's so many people that are trying to earn their way to heaven. That's coming to God by the law. And you can't get there. Because all the law can ever do is condemn you. Why? Because if you've broken one part of the law, you're guilty of all. One jot or tittle, he says. If you've broken one part of it, you're guilty of all of it. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, all the best things you can do, it's not going to get you there. In Romans, he says, there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. All the best things you do, it's just worthless. Joshua wasn't going into the promised land because he was so much better than Moses. Because he was more righteous than Moses. Because he was a better leader than Moses. I think Joshua was this quiet, mild man. And he was not presumptuous. He was just faithful. In fact, the rest of this passage is making sure that Moses commissions Joshua in the sight of the people to make sure that they know that God has picked him and then transfer that authority onto him. Can you imagine how great must it have been to be Joshua getting commissioned by Moses? For 40 years, man, that guy was faithful. And he stood by his side through all the stuff. You you know how people are. Man, highs, they're all on board. Praise God. But when the lows come, man, they're gone. But God's not working there. Oh, God's not using this. God's not doing something there. So, man, people are up and down all over the place. Joshua was faithful through thick and thin. Joshua went through that 40 years in the in the most miserable desert you've ever seen, wandering around, picking up manna every day, wondering when are these shoes going to wear out so I can get a new pair of shoes. But here's Moses and God commissioning him. be the man that takes them into the promised land. Why? Because he represents Jesus Christ. Why? Because by faith, he said, let's go in and conquer those giants. Because if God's for us, who can be against us? Let's obey God. Let's just step up and follow God. Oh, we can't listen to you. You don't know anything, Joshua. And now here he is standing before all the people, getting ready to take them into the promised land. I love the first thing that he does when he goes in the promised land is they march around. (laughs) Well, first, he has all the men be circumcised, a a symbol of purity, of let's get right with God first. And then they go into the promised land. They march around this walled city of Jericho. And then quietly, they can't say anything. And then the last day, they're blowing trumpets and the walls come tumbling down. I think then they're ready to follow him. Maybe you're here this morning and you think, God could never use me. I mean, I'm not the big I'm not the big man on campus. I'm not the person that, you know, that's boisterous and I'm not the person that can you know that, that's a great speaker. Listen, Moses couldn't speak. He was scared of his own shadow. He was afraid all the time. Joshua wasn't this great leader. Joshua was just a guy that was faithful. And maybe you're here this morning and you think God could never use you. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. 
God wants to use each of us. But have you proven yourself faithful to Him? Phineas, and that guy was a rock star. He was faithful for a minute. God said, that's not the guy I want. I want the guy that's proven himself over time. He's faithful. So maybe you're here and you're trying to earn your salvation. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing and regeneration. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you're saved. That's unmerited favor, not because of anything you do. For by grace you're saved through faith. Not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. I'm so glad I can't go to heaven and say, yeah, I got here because I did this and I did this because that's all we'd hear for the rest of eternity. But you know what we're going to say when I get to heaven? I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. Because it's only by grace that I've been saved. Listen, in this passage, there's great, it's a great character study about a humble servant, about owning up to our own sin. It's about, about faithfulness in, in the midst of all the stuff that goes on. It's about loving people above and putting their needs above our own. It's not an exhaustive list, but man, it's a great list for leadership. Leadership isn't how loud you say anything. It's not how how hyped up you are. It's about, are these things true in my life? I think it's a good, I, I think it's a good passage that we could all grow in. Listen, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where you stand with God. I don't know if you're a Christian. I don't know, I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you're you're wondering, can God ever use me? Listen to me. God wants to use you. I want to turn one passage before I close this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in fact, I'll I'll just give you a little hint. That's going to be the next passage. That's going to be the next book that I preach through is 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. It says, brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective. Not many powerful. Not many noble birth. Instead, God has chosen the world's foolish things to shame the wise. And God has chosen the world's weak things to shame the strong. And God has chosen the world's insignificant and despised things. The things viewed as nothing, so He might bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something so that no one can boast in His presence. That's my call to ministry right there. Because I was saying, God, how could you ever use me? And I remember my father-in-law showed me that verse, and I was like, there's me. Church, I don't know where you're at this morning. But I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And first, I want to ask you, maybe you're here this morning, and, and I don't know what your situation is, but maybe you've been trying to earn your way to heaven. I just want you to know, you can't do it. You can't do enough good works. You can't do enough good deeds. It's not, if your good outweighs your bad, you can't do it because you are guilty of all. If you're guilty of one thing, you're guilty of all of it. And you're condemned already. But God, whose rich and His great love wherewith He loved us, offered us grace and mercy. He sent His one and only Son to die in my place. To pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be counted as not guilty. Not because I'm such a good guy. Not because I'm a pastor. Not because I do so many good things. That has nothing to do with it. It's by grace I've been saved through faith. The result, of my, the result of my salvation ought to be I want to serve Christ with everything that I have. And maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ your Savior. 
And God's speaking to your heart right now and you say, Pastor, I, I've never trusted Christ. If I died right now, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. But God's dealing with me right now. Can you pray for me? If that's your prayer this morning, you say, Pastor, I, if I died, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. But can you pray for me? Because I need, I need salvation. If that's your prayer this morning, will you slip up your hand quickly? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, and, and you're saying, God, my life's such a mess. How could God ever use me? How can God ever use you? God wants to use you. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think. As you're sitting there thinking, well, man, I've done this or I've done that. Listen to me. Are you forgiven or aren't you? Paul was a murderer. And God used him to write three quarters of the New Testament. Why? Because when Paul got saved, he wasn't a murderer anymore. God transformed his life. And maybe you're here this morning and you're wondering, God, how can you use me? Lord, I'm too old. I'm too, I'm too fat. I'm too, I'm too, I don't, whatever your two is. Listen to me, God wants to use you. And it starts by being faithful. I'll share with you my plate theory before I think you start, you're faithful in the little things. Faithful to read my Bible and faithful to come to church and faithful to pray every day and to do the little things. Faithful to memorize Scripture. And as you're faithful in those things, God gives you more on your plate. And I think we see that perfectly with Joshua. Joshua was faithful for 40 years and now God made him the leader that's going to walk the people, walk the children of Israel into the promised land. What's God going to do with you? We'll never know if you're not faithful. So maybe God's dealing with you this morning about your faithfulness and you say, God, I want you to use me. Lord, I don't know how everything's going to work out. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. Listen, I don't either. But He does. Maybe God's dealing with you this morning about faithfulness. If, that's, if, if God's dealing with you and you say, Pastor, can you pray for me? Because I need Lord to deal with me about something, about my faithfulness or what God wants to do with me. But I need to be faithful. Can you pray for me? If that's your prayer, would you slip up your hands so I can pray for you? Amen. 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 In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. If you need to come this morning, the altar's open. It's not for anybody to gawk at you or anybody. To, it's for us to come and alongside you and pray with you. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we come before you today, and I thank you, Lord, for the hands that were raised. I thank you for the hearts that, God, that you're dealing with. And God, I pray, Lord, that as we, uh, Lord, as we walk by faith, not by sight, Lord, it's so, it's so hard to let go and get out of our way, Lord, and just let you do things, Lord. But we, Lord, we can trust you, God, because you love us. So, Lord, as we, uh, Lord, as we have this invitation, God, I pray that you'll continue to work in hearts, Lord. If people need to come to an altar, Lord, I pray that they come, Lord, that they can have people that will come and pray with them. Because all of us have fallen short, and all of us need more faith, and all of us need to be more faithful. God, I just pray that you'll have your will and your way with this invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name.